You expected science to give all the answers to the wonderful questions about what we are, where we're going, what the meaning of the universe is, and so on. Then I think you could easily become disillusioned and then look for some mystic answer to these problems. We're exploring, we're trying to find out as much as we can about the world. People say to me, are you looking for the ultimate uh, laws of physics? No, I'm not. I'm just looking to find out more about the world. And if it turns out there is a simple ultimate law that explains everything, so be it. That would be very nice to discover. If it turns out it's like an onion with millions of layers and we're just sick and tired of looking at the layers, then that's the way it is. But whatever way it comes out, its nature is there and she's going to come out the way she is. And therefore, when we go to investigate it, we shouldn't pre-decide what it is we're trying to do except to find out more about it. And so altogether, I can't believe the special stories that have been made up about our relationship to the universe at large because they seem to be too local, too provincial. The earth, he came to the earth. One of the aspects of God came to the earth, mind you. And look at what's out there. How can he, it isn't in proportion. It also, another thing, oh, has to do with the question of how do you find out if something's true? And if you have all these theories of, of the different religions, have all different theories about the thing, then you begin to wonder, once you start doubting, which I think is, to me is a very fundamental part of my soul, is to doubt and to ask. And when you doubt and ask, it gets a little harder to believe. I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything, and there are many things I don't know anything about. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, possibly. It doesn't frighten me. It's interesting that some people find science uh, so easy and others find it kind of dull and difficult. It, it, especially kids, you know, some of them are just eat it up. And I don't know why it is. It's the same perhaps for all subjects. For instance, lots of people love music and I never could carry a tune. And uh, it's, I lose a great deal of pleasure out of that. And I think people lose a lot of pleasure who find science dull. In the case of science, you think that one of the things that make it very difficult is it takes a lot of imagination. It's very hard to imagine all the crazy things that things really are like. Nothing's really as it seems. We used to get, you know, hot and cold, and all that hot and cold is is the speeds that the atoms are jiggling. If they jiggle more, it corresponds to hotter, and colder is jiggling less. So if you have uh, a bunch of atoms, a cup of coffee or something sitting uh, on a table. And the atoms are jiggling a great deal in the coffee and they bounce against the cup and the cup then gets shaking and the atoms in the cup shake and they bounce against the saucer and the heat heats the cup and heats everything else. And hot thing spreads its heat into other things by mere contact because the atoms that are jiggling a lot in the hot thing shake the ones that are jiggling only a little bit in the cold thing so that the hot heat, we say, goes into the cold thing, it spreads. But what's spreading is just jiggle and irregular motions, which is easy to kind of understand. Uh, the th it brings up another thing that's kind of curious, that uh, I say the things jiggle, and if you're used to balls bouncing, you know they slow up and stop after a while. But we have to imagine with the atoms a perfect elasticity. They never lose any energy. Every time they bounce, they keep on bouncing all the time. They don't lose anything. They're perpetually moving. And that the things that happen when we say something loses energy, if a ball comes down and bounces, it shakes irregularly some of the atoms in the floor. And then when it comes up again, it leaves some of those atoms moving, the jiggling. So as it bounces, it's passing its extra energies, its extra motions, to little patches on the floor each time it bounces and loses a little each time until it settles down, we say, as if all the motion has stopped. But what's left 
is the floor is shaking more than it was before and the atoms in the ball are shaking more than they were before. That the organized motion of all these atoms moving the same way, falling down, and the quiet floor is now transformed into a ball sitting on the ground. But all that emotion is still there in a form, or the energy of motion, in the form of the jiggling of the floor, which is a little bit warmer. Unbelievable. But anybody who's hammered a great deal on something knows that it's true, that if you pound something and hit it a lot, you can feel the temperature difference. It heats up. It heats up simply because you're jiggling it. This picture of Adams is a beautiful one. You can keep looking at all kinds of things this way. You see a little drop of water, a tiny drop. And uh, the atoms attract each other. They like to be next to each other. They want as many partners as they can get. Now, the guys that are at the surface have only partners on one side here, in the air on the other side, so they're trying to get in. And you can imagine this team of people, these teeming people, all moving very fast, all trying to get to have as many partners as possible, and the guys at the edge are very unhappy and nervous, and they keep pounding in, trying to get in, and that makes it a tight ball instead of a flat. And that's what, you know, surface tension, the way you, when you realize, when you see how sometimes a water drop sits like this on a table, then you start to imagine why it sits like that, because everybody's trying to get into the water. And uh, at the same time, while all this is happening, there are these atoms that are leaving the surface, and the water drop is slowly disappearing. I find myself trying to imagine all kinds of things all the time, and I get a kick out of it, just like a runner gets a kick out of sweating. <laughs> I get a kick out of thinking about these things. Uh, I can't stop. I mean, I, you could make, I could talk forever. If you cooled off the water so the jiggling is less and less and it jiggles slower and slower, then the atoms get stuck in place. They like to be with their friend. They, there's a force of attraction and they get packed together. They're not rolling over each other. They're in a nice pattern, like oranges in a crate, in a nice organized pattern, all just jiggling in place, but not having enough motion to get loose of their own place and to break the structure down. And that's what I'm describing as a solid. It's ice. It has a structure. If you held the atoms at one end in a certain position, all the rest are lined up in a position sticking out, and it's solid at the end. Whereas if you heat that harder, then they begin to get loose and roll all over each other, and that's the liquid. And if you heat that still harder, and they bounce harder, then they simply bounce apart from each other, and they're just individual, I say atoms, it's really little groups of atoms, molecules, which come flying and hit and although they have a tendency to stick, they're moving too fast, their hands don't grab, so to speak, as they pass, and they fly apart again. And this is the gas we call steam. Uh, you can get all kinds of understanding. When I was a kid with, a, with this air, which I was always interested in, I noticed that when I pumped up my tires in a bicycle, you can learn a lot by having a bicycle, they'd pump up the tires that the pump would get hot. And that also understand, we see, as the pump handle comes down and the atoms are coming up against it and bouncing off and it's moving in, the ones that are coming off have a bigger speed than the ones that are coming in, so that as it comes down and each time they collide, it speeds them up. And so they're hotter. When you compress the gas, it heats. And when you pull the piston back out, then atoms which are coming fast at the piston feel a receding or a sort of a give. It gives and it comes out with less energy. It's like going up against something which is soft and yielding. It goes boom, boom, and it loses. So as you pull the piston out and the atoms are hit, they lose their speed and they cool off. And gases cool when they expand. And the fun of it is that all these things which you see or you notice in the world about it, the pump heats the gas and they, or the gas cools when it expands or the steam evaporates until you cover the cover and all these things you can understand from these simple pictures. Now that's kind of a, a lot of fun to think about. I don't want to take this stuff seriously. I think we should just have fun imagining it, not worry about it. There's no teacher going to ask you questions at the end. Otherwise, it's a horrible subject. I take the Mayan Indians. They had a writing system, and we know some of the things they wrote were astronomical things. And they had a scheme for predicting th many things in the sky, eclipses and so on. Let's take the example of when Venus, which was important to them because it represented evil of some sort, was a morning star and when it was an evening star. So they could predict ahead of time whether this bad influence was going to be in the morning or in the evening. And so they discovered 
that if they waited, that this cycle of morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, five of those occupied just exactly the same time as eight times a certain period that was important to them, 365 days. It's not exactly a year, and they knew the difference but they still counted in 365-day intervals, which they called a tune. So they said that five of these cycles is eight tunes. Then they uh, discovered, of course, very quickly, that if they did this five-cycle bit for eight tunes ten times, they were off by about six days. And so they had a rule for shifting, the, making corrections as they went along, and thus had a very good way to predict when Venus was coming up. Okay. Now let's uh, look at this thing from a point of view. Suppose that the professors, the priests in those days, who wrote this stuff and taught their students these rules, were giving a lecture to try to explain what they did in order to make these wonderful predictions about Venus. Then, if the fellow was any good at exposition and really knew what he was doing, he would say, what we're doing is we're counting the days, just like you're putting nuts in a pot. And we keep on counting uh, 365 nuts and then another 365 and another 365 and another 365. Guys, what a lot of work. And when we get all finished, we say, that's five of these periods. Now they understood what he said. That's easy. They did not know a quick and tricky way to add 365 times eight. I'm sorry, I said five times. I meant eight times. Uh, the students were learning in the meantime the laws of arithmetic, something which is to us now, because we have public and free edu uh, general education, almost everybody has to struggle through and learn how to add numbers by a tricky scheme of writing them in place system and making carryings and so on, so that a, if you buy wine for $4.15 and your meal is two eighty seven or vice versa, it costs seven oh two. And the girl who does this, the waitress, just an ordinary person in two minutes does that. How did she do it? What is she doing when she's adding 415 to 287? She's doing this, counting out 415 pennies, then counting out 287 more pennies and telling you how many pennies you would have got if you counted them all from the beginning to the end. But it's a highly educated and very trained to be able to do that with those large numbers quickly. This training is, is something, in spite of the fact that everybody's got it, it's something pretty good because in the 14th century, mathematicians were they were called who could do that almost everybody in our civilization can do that but i would i took this example you can understand what's involved what the students are taught you see in our particular problems now about physics there are many bigger numbers the numbers are much bigger it's hard to get numbers are so enormous you can't count them directly and so we've invented a fantastic array of tricks and gimmicks for putting together the numbers, adding, counting, checking, and so forth, without actually doing it the way I could describe what we're trying to do. If I say, I draw this and I draw that and I draw this and I draw that and I see where the end point is, we don't actually sit down and draw 7,000 arrows and find out where the end point, we have a way of figuring out where it comes, just like we don't actually count 415 pennies and 287 pennies to find out that you owe me 702 pennies. We do it by another trick. This are the tricks of mathematics, and that's all. So that's the part I'm not going to worry about. We're not going to worry about that. So they'll relax. You don't have to know mathematics. All you have to know is what it is. All it is is tricky ways of doing something which would be laborious otherwise. <laughs> so what... The, it, true that in the years we have developed enormous abilities in mathematics and it takes a long time to train the students and so therefore they're very highly educated in that but if you ask them why now we go back to the Mayans we ask them why the rule why when you wait for fill up a tub eight times with 365 day markers it comes out that the Venus is up five times they don't know they don't understand it at all. The more accurately they can do it, the fact that they know that they have to change it by six days and so forth, adds nothing to their understanding of it. The student who has learned all this mathematics and is able to make these calculations, not only of Venus, of the Mars, or the Sun, or the, 
the eclipses and everything else is a super priest. Doesn't know why. Any better. And if he would explain it's nothing but counting days, he would be reduced to the truth on the one hand and to an honest statement that he doesn't understand it. On the other hand, and could tell somebody all about it who doesn't know how to count all these numbers so trickily and so cleverly. As the priest students knew, okay? Now, probably, I don't know about philosophy of Mayas. We have very little information due to the efficiency of the Spanish conquistadores and, uh, well, mostly their priests who burned all the books. They had hundreds of thousands of books, and there's three left, and one of them has this penis calculation. In them, in it. So that's how we know about that. And uh, just imagine our civilization reduced to three books the particular ones left by accident, which ones, see? Eh? So, uh, anyway, I get off the subject. If I make this up now, that what I'm saying now is just a story. Suppose now that the students would discuss, or people would discuss the possible meanings of this. Why? Then they would begin to think about, well, 8 times 365 is 2920. That's got two twos in it. Now, two is a lucky number, and it has two twos in it. <laughs> And then the nine represents the god of so-and-so, which is related to Venus, and so forth, and that would be a good argument. Then, but in another city, some other guys getting together have a different kind of an argument about it. They say, look, now, the fact that there's a 20 at the end, if I subtracted that away first, I get 2,900, which is especially a good number from blah, 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 and so on. And they would have different theories. And then someone would come along and say, you know, it doesn't make any difference which one of these theories is right. We still have this fact to go along with. And that is our modern scientific point of view. In the earliest days of science, we got confused arguing philosophically what was a reasonable reason for nature of hoard of vacuum, or it seemed to be nice that you know, gods were doing it. There are different kinds of psychological reasons for thinking it probably is all right after you discovered what it was. These things were never useful for predicting what should happen next, and we soon learned not to make these arguments. It's useless. It doesn't add anything. And so we're not going to make my imaginary Mayan uh, arguments about the various gods that make the numbers. And so I'm left, if I'm a modern scientist, with a description of the situation. All right? Now the atoms like each other the different degrees. Uh, oxygen, for instance, in the air would like to be next to carbon. And if they get near each other, they snap together. If they're not too close, though, they repel and they go apart, so they don't know that they could snap together. It's just as if you had a ball that was trying to climb a hill and there was a hole it could go into, like a volcano hole, a deep one. It's rolling along. It doesn't go down in the deep hole because if it starts to climb the hill and then rolls away again. But if you made it go fast enough, it'll fall into the hole. And so if you have something like wood in oxygen, there's carbon in the wood from a tree, and the oxygen comes and hits it carbon, but not hard enough. It just goes away again. You know, the air is always coming, nothing's happening. If you can get it faster by heating it up somehow, somewhere, somehow, get it started, a few of them come fast, they go over the top, so to speak, they come close enough to the carbon and snap in. And that gives a lot of jiggly motion, which might hit some other atoms, making those go faster so they can climb up and bump against other carbon atoms and they jiggle and they make mothers jiggle and you get a terrible catastrophe which is one after the other all these things are going faster and faster and snapping in and the whole thing is changing that catastrophe is a fire it's just a way of looking at it and these things are happening they perpetual once it gets started it keeps on going the heat makes the other atoms capable of reaching to make more heat to make other atoms and so on so this terrible snapping is producing a lot of jiggling, and if I put, with all that activity of the atoms there, and I put a cup of coffee over that massive wood that's doing this, it's going to get a lot of jiggling. So that's what the heat of the fire is. And then, of course, uh, if you see, this is what happens when you start to think. You just go out and I wonder where, how did it get started? Why is it that the wood's been sitting around all this time with the oxygen all this time, and it didn't do this earlier or something? Where did I get this from? Well, it came from a tree. And the, the substance of a tree is carbon. And where did that come from? That comes from the air. 
it's carbon dioxide from the air. People look at trees and they think it comes out of the ground, that plants grow out of the ground. But if you ask where the substance comes from, you find out where does it come from? The trees come out of the air? They surely come out of the air. No, they come out of the air. The carbon dioxide in the air goes into the tree and it changes it, kicking out the oxygen and uh, pushing the oxygen away from the carbon and leaving the carbon substance with water. Water comes out of the ground, you see. Only it had to get in there. It came out of the air, didn't it? It came down from the sky. So in fact, most of a tree, almost all of the tree is out of the ground. I'm sorry, it's out of the air. There's a little bit from the ground, some minerals and so forth. Now, of course, I told you the oxygen, we, we snow the oxygen and carbon stick together, very tight. How is it the tree is so smart as to manage to take the carbon dioxide, which is the carbon oxygen nicely combined, and undo that so easy? Ah, life, life has some mysterious force. No, the sun is shining. And it's the sunlight that comes down and knocks this oxygen away from the carbon. So it takes sunlight to get the plant to work. And so the sun all the time is doing the work of separating the oxygen away from the carbon. The oxygen is some kind of terrible byproduct, which it spits back into the air and leaving the carbon and water and stuff to make the substance of the tree. Then when we take the substance of the tree and stick it in the fireplace, and the, there's all the oxygen made by these trees, and all the carbon would, would be much prefer to be close together again. And once you let the heat to get it started, it continues and makes an awful lot of activity while it's going back together again. And all this nice light and everything comes out and everything is being undone. You're going back from carbon and oxygen back to carbon dioxide. And the light and heat that's coming out, that's the light and heat of the sun that went in. So it's sort of stored sun that's coming out when you burn it, a log. Next question, how is it the sun is so jiggly, so hot? I gotta stop somewhere. I'll leave you something to imagine. <laughs> Most elastic things like steel springs and so on is nothing but this electrical thing pulling back. You pull the atoms a little bit apart when you bend something, and then they try to come back together again. But rubber bands work on a different principle. There, there's some long molecules like chains and other little ones that are shaking all the time that are bombarding them, these chains. And the chains are all kind of kinky and knocked about and shaped. When you pull open the rubber band, the strings get straighter. But these strings are being bombarded on the side by these other atoms trying to shorten them by kinking them. So it pulls back. It's trying to pull back, and it's pulling back only because of the heat. So if you heat a rubber band, it'll pull strong, more strongly, for instance. If you hang a weight with a rubber band and put a little match to it, it's kind of fun to watch it rise the way it heats more. And there's another thing you can check that this idea is right that is heat that drives a rubber band. If you pull the band out, just like when we push the piston and the gas, if you pull the band out, the tightening string hitting those molecules makes them move faster, and so it's warmer. And if you take the band and let it in, then the molecules hitting the strings, which sort of give as the thing hits, so they, they give in to the soft like, and they lose energy when they hit these retiring Band, uh, string, strings, so it cools. And there is a little way you can do this. You're not very sensitive, it's a small effect. And if you take a, a fairly wide rubber band and put it between your lips and pull it out, you'll certainly notice it's hotter. And if you then hold it out and let it in, you'll notice it's cooler. At least you'll notice a certain difference in whether, what happens when you expand it, when you contract it. And that's, I've always found rubber bands fascinating to think that when they're sitting, on an old package of papers for a long time, holding those papers together. It's done by a perpetual pounding, pounding, pounding of the atoms against these chains to hold it, trying to kink them and trying to kink them year after year. Well, rubber bands don't last that long, but anyhow, for a long time, trying to hold this whole thing together. The world is a dynamic mess of jiggling things, if you look at it right. And if you magnify it, you can hardly see anything anymore because everything's jiggling and they're all in patterns and they're all lots of little balls. And 
it's lucky that we have such a large scale view of everything that we can see them as things without having to worry about all these little atoms all the time. My, my feeling, Charlie, is that um, it's, it's not that um, pseudoscience and superstition and uh, new age so-called beliefs and uh, fundamentalist zealotry are something new. They've been with us for as long as we've been, we've yeah. been human. But we live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. Science and technology are propelling us forward at accelerating rates. That's right. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress? But there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And the Republican Congress has just abolished its own Office of Technology Assessment, mm -hmm. the organization that gave them bipartisan, competent <laughs> advice on science yeah. and technology. They say, we don't want to know. Don't tell yeah. us about science Surprising. and technology. Surprising. the danger of all this. I mean, you know, this is not the thing that... There, there's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that I'm, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us mm -hmm. that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious, who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson laid great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated, and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us.